Discovery, this is Houston. Larry King is on the line. Are you ready to begin the interview? Uh, we're ready. Larry King, this is Houston. Please go ahead with your interview. Columbia in 1989. Colonel James Buckley, mission specialist. He's flown three times prior. And Captain John Creighton is the commander of the shuttle. He has flown twice before. As we join them and we can see them, and they all look terrific, the shuttle, we've got this special satellite hookup. The shuttle is moving at 17,000 miles an hour. It's over the Marshall Islands off the west coast of Australia. By the time we finish in 20 minutes, they'll be approaching the west coast of Canada. And first we have to say, does the capsule communicator in Houston ready to put us in touch with the astronauts? Larry King, this is Houston Capcom. Please go ahead with your interview. Guys, how are you? You can all hear us, right? We're doing fine. We're going to read you loud and clear, Larry. I'll read you loud and clear. Now, is that Captain Creighton? That's me. Okay, Captain, you look real good. Uh, there was a near... We'll start with you, Captain, and we'll take some calls from, from listeners. There was a near miss in space today. Discovery had to change orbit to avoid a piece of Soviet cosmos upper stage. Is space junk becoming more of a problem, Captain? At some altitudes it is. Normally at the altitudes that we fly the shuttle, why it's self-cleansing. Most of the uh, material up there decays in relatively short period of time, but as you get higher, objects stay longer, and then it becomes more and more of a problem. But yes, it is becoming a problem, and it is a concern, particularly for Space Station Freedom that's going to be up in space for years. Sam, you're going to land at night about 24 hours from now. Uh, is that more risky? Well, I think if you ask any pilot, there's a little more risk involved in landing at night than in the daytime just because you don't have the depth perception that you've got in the uh, daytime. But uh, uh, Ken and I have done all of our practice uh, for the last uh, year at night, and so we both feel uh, confident that we'll be able to bring the shuttle in right on the money. Now, Ken, is, this is Ken's first one, isn't it, uh, John? Yeah, he's the only rookie on this flight. Can we hand the mic over to him? Because I'm I just... a rookie, excuse me. Right. How does it feel? Can Ken hear me? Which one is Ken? Yeah, Larry, go ahead. What's the first one like? Well, I can tell you it was quite a ride going uphill, and uh, when we got here, it was like nothing else I've ever felt in my life. Would you guys uh, all like to work with the Soviets more closely? Anyone can take this. Let's see, they've got one mic that they're handing around to each other, so and it floats right to them. All right, who's that responding in the green shirt with the white? This is Jim Buckley. Hi, Jim. Would you like to... And the answer is I think uh, all of us would. Uh, I think as we get further into our space programs, it will become evident that all of us uh, throughout the world need to cooperate in that effort uh, for our own, everyone's mutual benefit. Okay, what we're doing is if you'd hand the mic back to Captain Creighton, we are going to start taking calls from listeners now. Now, this is the first time ever we have our five astronauts, they are Kenneth, Sam, Mark, James, and John. John is the uh, uh, commander of the shuttle. We are going to go to the first caller from San Antonio, Texas. Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks, Larry. It seems like going into space will be a life-changing experience. What is it? Uh, what caused it? What, what really changed you when you went up to space? John? I don't know that I could uh, point to any one single thing. I think that uh, what all of us spend any free time we have doing is uh, looking out the world and watching the, the uh, looking out the windows and watching the world go by. And, you know, instead of just watching street signs go by, whiz and by the car as you drive down the highway, we watch continents whiz by. And it tends to give you more of a global perspective and an appreciation for the environment. And uh, when you look out at the horizon and you see uh, the atmosphere and it's only about an inch thick, you realize just how fragile this planet can be, and we better learn to take care of it. Austin, Texas is the next caller. Hello. Yes, would any of you gentlemen like to be the first man on Mars? Would anyone, let's pass it around to someone. Is uh, Mark Brown there? Mark is over on the, to the right of the captain. Mark, would you like to go to Mars? Well, probably not this week. Uh, that's kind of a long trip. I think it's something that we definitely do need to do. I'm not sure that I personally will be in the program long enough to do that, but uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that volunteer to go. 
Our next caller is from St. Petersburg, Florida. These guys are going 17,000 miles an hour. You're talking to them live. Hello. Gentlemen, what is it like to sleep when you're weightless? Okay, what is it like? Who wants to take that to sleep when you... This is the only one we haven't heard from, so this would be who? This is Sam. You talk to you later. Okay, Sam Jamar. What's it like to sleep in space? Well, I tell you, the, uh, the biggest thing that I notice in sleeping is that your body feels totally supported. Uh, and it's very restful, uh, very serene. And uh, I've never had any problem up here uh, in my previous flight or on this flight uh, sleeping. It tends to, uh, again, I was, we work pretty hard uh, by the time it's that time where we've put in a 16-hour day and uh, always been busy and I'm always ready to go sleep. But just close our eyes and... Uh, John, do you dream? Uh, not that I remember, but uh, being the captain has its uh, privileges. Uh, my particular sleep station is right under the overhead windows in the flight deck so that if I happen to wake up during the middle of the night and we sleep with a, a mask on because it gets daylight every 45 minutes, you can take the mask off and look out the window and watch the world go by. And uh, if it's something interesting, I may stay awake and watch uh, for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour and uh, as we go around the world and then put the mask down and go to sleep for another couple hours. New York City is our next caller for Kenneth uh, Riders, Sam Jamar, Mark Brown, James Buckley, and Sean Creighton. Hello. Uh, good evening. Um, hello up there. Um, suppose if you were like me, who always wanted to be an astronaut, but because of medical reasons, have finally concluded that he couldn't and already had to sign terrific training, what other jobs in the space program would attract you? What would attract you in space if you couldn't uh, fly? Anyone could take it. Mark? Well, let me take a crack at it. This is Jim. Um, I think probably even more than being uh, a member of the crew, being part of the uh, shuttle team is, uh, is just as rewarding. And uh, one needs to remember that while you're able to see the five of us on board the shuttle, there are literally thousands of people supporting the program, getting us ready to go fly, getting payloads ready to go, integrating the program and getting the vehicles ready. And each one of those jobs is an integral and very rewarding part of the, of the whole program. Everyone I've talked to seems to have that same feeling and that same dedication and sense of purpose. So the best answer I can say is any part of the space program is a great job, and each part is recognized as being uh, a very integral and very... Uh, important part of the whole. Ithaca, New York. Hello. Ithaca, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. Space travel alter your dreams. Did you bring your wallet? Did you bring your... What do you bring along? Anybody bring... Your, <laughs> <laughs> Captain Creighton is laughing. We can see the astronauts, by the way. We have a special uh, hookup here that we can see them. Did you guys bring money? John? Now, yeah, we didn't bring money. They take pretty good care of us here. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid our wives have got our wallets back home. <laughs> New York City, hello. Yes, gentlemen, uh, hello. Uh, do you think uh, we'll ever see civilian space flight, and how soon? How soon for civilians? Uh, who wants to take that, Jim or, or Sam? I'm not sure I understand the question. If the question was, uh, you know, do you think we'll see uh, civilians, uh, uh, non-professional astronauts in space anytime soon, uh, I think that, uh, you know, when there's a need, and in fact, I think that uh, the uh, another uh, school teacher has been designated to be the first civilian to fly on a future uh, flight. Uh, that flight has not yet been named. I think it will happen uh, just how soon, uh, I really couldn't say. Uh, now, right now, I'm looking at all five of you. You're all very relaxed. You're wearing comfortable, look like South Florida kind of wear in August. Who's piloting the ship? I mean, who's who's looking out? None of you are looking out the window. Who's running things? I know we forgot something. <laughs> now, actually, we have a very good, uh, a very good autopilot on board, and generally speaking, does a very good job. We Next. just tell them occasionally which direction to point us. New Haven, Connecticut, for the astronauts in space. Hello. 
thanks. Thank you, Larry. Gentlemen, it's an honor and a thrill to speak with you. I'd like to know what was unusual or different about the position of the sun and the orbiter that made you visible to the naked eye uh, so long after launch as far to the north as you were able to be seen. Okay, anyone can take that. Yeah, the uh, phenomena you saw, because of the low sun angle and the altitude of the flight and, and again, the direction that uh, that we launched the orbiter in, which was up the east coast, uh, we were we were clearly visible, uh, I suspect, uh, probably all the way up beyond New York, and uh, in some cases may have even been off the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, again, it was because of the low sun angle and the high altitude uh, that, uh, that we launched it in the direction of the east coast. You're also going to be pretty visible uh, coming back, I hear, to Palm Bay, Florida. Hello. Hello. How are you, Larry? Fine. Hi. I just want to talk to one of the astronauts. Anyone will do. Okay. They can all hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I just want to know, do they ever have any scary thoughts when they look down, when they look back at us? Okay. Let's hand it over to I guess, uh, Jim Buckley, who hasn't been heard from in a, in a couple of moments here. Is that, where's, which one is, who's on the right of you, Captain? I, I'm, I'm okay, I, I'm, I'm a little lost now. This is Mark Brown over here. Okay. Mark hasn't been heard in a couple of seconds. Mark, is there anything scary about this? Uh, not really. It, the view down is not much different from flying a high-speed jet at high altitude. I guess the difference is that the space shuttle continues to go around the Earth without jets constantly firing. And you can't just stop and land anytime you want to. It takes rather coordinated rocket burns to decelerate the orbiter to come in for landing. Uh, there is some sense of remoteness from the Earth and the people down there. Your inner reaction with the planet is different from when you're down in the atmosphere and that you don't feel the air in your face or smell the flowers or anything like that. It's very much a visual sensation of all the hues and colors to the point where the Earth very much looks flat, except for its sphericity, because uh, even mountains that are a couple miles high look relatively flat when you're over 300 miles above them. So it's it's a different sensation, but not necessarily one that's scary. Mid Pines, California. Hello. Hi. Right, what a thrill. Uh, greetings from just south of Yosemite National Park. Um, I hope Dr. Fisk will take note of my question too, and perhaps comment later. Um, greetings to all the astronauts. Um, What's the question? Happy that you launched the uh, UR satellite tonight to study ozone destruction, but it, it's ironic, and here's the question, because every space shuttle launch puts out 75 tons of chlorine, which destroys the ozone, and that's larger in one launch than uh, so many... Uh, agree with that, Captain? You think you're putting out more than <laughs> you're investigating? Well, I certainly hope not. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not qualified uh, to answer that, that I question. Uh, I know there is some concern with the... Uh, solid rocket plume, but I think in, on the whole, we're doing more good than harm. Champaign, Illinois, hello. Hi, guys. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, I think we all dream about going off in space, and I wondered uh, what your feelings were when you finally realized, uh, whatever age you were, that you were actually going to be astronauts. Hello, they all can't answer, so let's let Kenneth, this is his first flight, answer it. What's this all like? I think uh, most of us in the program have uh, wanted to be astronauts for a long time. I certainly have, and worked hard to uh, to get down there in the program, and worked in the program until we were selected for a flight. And I can tell you, from my perspective right now, it was is worth every second of the wait. It's a uh, great experience, a great opportunity to uh, make a contribution to the nation and the world, and I'm real proud to be a small part of that. Rogers, Minnesota. Hello. Hi. I have a question about space station freedom. Go ahead. What? What is it? One day I plan on being on space station freedom as an astronaut, and I heard that you're planning on purchasing from the cosmonauts their space station. Is that true, or are we still going ahead with that? You know, Congress will have money. I think that's a better question for someone here on the ground of uh, purchasing from freedom uh, in space. Grand Rapids, Michigan, hello. Hello, real quickly. Uh, seeing as how the astronauts have a vantage point of the universe that most of us do not, I'd like to know one or all of their opinions on possible extraterrestrial life and UFOs. Okay, does anyone, anyone could take that. We'll, I guess we'll, uh, how about, uh, how about Sam? Sam is yeah, thanks, Larry. Uh, well, let me just start out by saying, uh, in the, uh, in the 
nearly 10 days, I guess, that uh, my limited space experience, uh, I haven't seen no evidence uh, of, of extraterrestrial life or any, any uh, UFOs. Uh, and, and in talking with other people, uh, I've never uh, talked with anybody that, uh, at least in the astronaut office, that, uh, that has had, had any evidence of any either. Uh, I guess the rest of it is all uh, philosophy, whether or not we believe that we are the sole beings of the, uh, of the universe and beyond, or whether there are other, other uh, life forms out there. One of the dangers in answering the question is we have to first understand what it is we're looking for. When you talk about extraterrestrial life, uh, we know life is a carbon-based object, and, uh, and our search may involve uh, species that, that are something other than that. So, again, I think it's a, a question of individual philosophy. And, and I've seen no evidence of it, uh, but I think that uh, that there's uh, I think it's beneficial to uh, to continue the quest and the search. Last caller, Fields Landing, California. Hello. Hello. This is Randall Norris Bell from Fields Landing, California. I'd like to say, uh, first of all, bless y'all in outer space, and I hope you have a very good time. I'd like to know what do you do when you're about all your oxygen? Huh? How do you know uh, when to fill the tanks up, and how do you know when you're out of air and, and, and with? Captain, what about oxygen supply? You ever worry about that? We only have about a minute. Well, we obviously are concerned with all of our consumables, not just oxygen, but uh, hydrogen, uh, monomethyl hydrogen. We carry all sorts of propellants on board, that, uh, and we watch them very closely, and so does the ground. And we're under those all of those consumables determine how long we can stay up, and when we start running out, it's time to come home. And if we should have a lake or something, we just come home a little early. Do you get any turbulence, or is this very smooth? Real smooth once you get up here, but it's quite a ride on the way up. <laughs> there is turbulence on the way up. A lot of shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> uh, you guys, we, we thank you for this uh, 20 minutes. This has been historic. With certainly the people that were able to get through will always remember it. The people that listened were able to remember it. We're able to see you. I thank you very much, uh, Captain Creighton, on behalf of everyone here on Earth. We look forward to a very safe return. When do you guys come back? Uh, tomorrow night, about 20, uh, a little less than 24 hours from now. Thanks very much, guys. You can all say goodbye to Thank Captain. Thank you, Larry. There you go. Discovery Houston, that was great. Thanks a lot.